When she was just 17, Tammy Lynn Liepert had it all. She was a beauty queen, an accomplished model, who was well on her way to a career in the movies. But in 1982, Tammy began to withdraw, growing increasingly paranoid, until finally she vanished. Can. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is a bi weekly podcast covering true crime, unsolved mysteries, missing people, urban legends, and the dark side of the Sunshine State. So, first, if you would like to support our show, you can help us out by subscribing to our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Paradise After Dark podcast. Spelt exactly how it sounds. On Patreon, you'll have access to bonus episodes, spin off shows, vacation edition, Discounts on our merchandise and much, much more. Oh, and don't forget, we started a new program called The Prize Wheel. Yes, we have a prize wheel once a month. Every one of our patrons will have an opportunity to win a free t-shirt. Yep, we spin a little wheel and this this month's winner is Lisa M. Lisa M. Won so, this month. congratulations. So, if you have a question, a Florida case suggestion, or you'd just like to chat, please email us at paradiseafterdarkpodcast at gmail.com. And once again, we will be at CrimeCon Austin in June 2021 and CrimeCon UK in London the very next weekend, June 2021. Well, all right. So no matter where you are in the world, no matter which event or both you're going to, use code PARADISE21 for 10% off your ticket. Please, please, please use it. All right. So... Um, this week we are discussing a a case, and it's funny because this is a cold is, case. It's a cold case, but I didn't know literally about this case. And I got to tell you, I remember seeing this movie on HBO, the movie we're about to talk about. Yeah, she was an actress on this movie. I saw it on HBO back in the day because we had thirty three channels. My my mom worked at the cable company, so. We got all 33 cable channels, including HBO. Wow. Technically, this is not a movie for a kid my age but on you HBO. But it anyway. Well, that's what happens when you get HBO and you sneak out on the couch in the middle of the night. <laughs> so let's uh, jump into this case. So we're talking about the disappearance of Tammy Lynn Liepert. Tammy Lynn Liepert left her family's home in Rockledge, Florida at 11 a.m. on July 6, 1983 and was never seen again. She was 18 at the time of her disappearance. She was five foot four and weighed between 105 and 115 pounds with long curly blonde hair and hazel eyes. She was last seen wearing a blue denim skirt, a light blue shirt with flowers on it, and flip flops carrying a gray purse. She may spell her name T-A-M-M-I. She occasionally uses the T-A-M-M-I spelling of her name and or Tammy Lynn as stage names as she was a model and small-time actress with small parts in movies like Spring Break and Scarface. That I think Spring Break is the movie you were just yep, talking about. That's the one. So she was born February 5th, 1965, and she would be 55 years old today. Well, as Lauren mentioned, uh, Tammy was a model throughout most of her childhood, and I guess that includes all the way through her teenage years. And her dream was to go to Hollywood, which most models usually are. You know, going to go Model, to actress, yeah. Exactly. Hollywood's I mean, like the end goal. Exactly. That's the end goal. Some people that can't act still fly to Hollywood and live there. <laughs> and she began participating in these contests since she was like four, year, four years old, which... Yeah, that, like beauty pageants yeah, at that, four years old. Yeah, and which is kind of like that John Bonet Ramsey. I kind of, when I was going through reading it, that's kind of what I pictured before I started looking up pictures of her. Mm -hmm. But now as a child, she competed in almost... 300 beauty pageants. Actually, they said it was over 300 beauty pageants and won a vast majority of them taking home 280 crowns. Wow. Yeah. That's, so she was, she was obviously good at the beauty pageants. And before long, Tammy was picking up parts in local commercials and eventually she was on the Cover Girl magazine, which most women know Cover Girl magazine. Is this still in publication? 
co- I don't think so. I don't think so either, but it, maybe it is. If not, I, I remember CoverGirl magazine, not that I looked at them. She appeared on the front of CoverGirl magazine in October of 1978, and she also had a lead role playing herself in a movie called CoverGirl Behind the Scenes. And it was right before her disappearance that she had a small part in the movie Scarface. Everybody knows Scarface. Um, she played the girl who was a distraction to the lookout car during the bloody chainsaw shower scene. And if you haven't seen it, well, you should go watch it. So Tammy was one of five children, her parents having divorced when she was just seven years old. At the time of her disappearance, she was the only one still living at home with her mother, Linda Curtis. Now, Linda was a pageant coach and child modeling agent. So picture like pageant moms or dance moms, you know, those reality shows. Mm -hmm. She owned a talent agency called Galaxy Model Workshop and was known to turn young talent into beauty pageant and talent show winners. As she did with her daughter for 280 crowns. Linda essentially guided Tammy's career. A young man named Wing Flanagan also lived with them. Wing had been with them since he was 11 years old and was like a younger brother to Tammy. And so Wing Flanagan was actually a... Was he a model too? He was. He was trying to be a model or an actor. And Linda Curtis, Tammy Lynn's mother, was helping him. And for some reason, I never got to the bottom of why, he moved in with the family. And basically, so he, she was acting as the agent. Yes. Basically. But basically, he was living with this family as if they were his own family. Yeah, I wasn't sure how that came about, but that makes sense. Well, just prior to her disappearance, her mother testified that she had been acting strangely and appeared to be under some sort of emotional distress. Right. Well, in July of 1982, Tammy landed a small part in the movie Spring Break. When the movie completed filming in August of 1982... Tammy went to a weekend party to celebrate. Which we believe is was, in, was in Tampa. Was in the Tampa, Sarasota area because that's where the movie was, was filming. Exactly. The whole base was there. So that was on the other coast of Florida from where Tammy lived. So exactly. she was away from home. Now, according to Wing Flanagan, she came back from that weekend party as a different person. Tammy left for the party an optimistic and bubbly young woman and returned sullen and extremely paranoid. She didn't speak of the party much after she came home. So what could have happened to Tammy at this party? Thoughts? I I don't know yet. But back home, she yelled and screamed, accused family and friends of trying to poison her. She began to isolate herself in her bedroom and refused to leave the house unaccompanied. When someone would call, she would ask Wing to tell them she was not home. On one occasion, she told Wing that she believed that the neighbors were spying on her through mirrored windows in their new van. Yeah, he she she made him look out the window and say, what's that? What is that? And it was the neighbors had gotten a new van, and she thought... Because there was mirrored windows yeah. that they were spying on her. Yeah, they, they can't see us. Or they can see us, we can't see them. She refused to eat food prepared for her or from open containers because she thought someone might poison her. She would even have Wing taste her food for poison before she ate it. Could you imagine what is possible possibly occurred for for that to have happened to this young girl? I have no idea. At one point she told her mother that someone was trying to kill her. She wouldn't elaborate more than to say that she had seen something unspeakable at the party. She wouldn't tell her mom what she saw or who they, quote unquote, they were. So she, who but was she, trying but, to kill her. But she felt like someone was trying to kill her. So what, I mean, what could have possibly happened to this party? Well, I mean, I mean, there's I, so many different I, scenarios. I, yeah, exactly. So, well, maybe we'll get into some of them here in a little bit. Okay. Well, in March of 1983, Tammy was offered the small part in the movie Scarface. Now she accepted the part and went off to Miami to film. Now, while they're in Miami, Tammy stayed with a family friend, Walter Leibowitz. And all was going real well, and everything was just fine until the fourth day of filming. There was a bad scene, literally a bad scene that happened. Quote, I received a call from the casting director to tell me that Tammy had a breakdown on the set. They said that it was from a scene where someone was supposed to be shot and had artificial blood spurt out. And they said when Tammy was watching the scene, she started crying hysterically and got so bad that they had to take her to her own trailer. She was in a tremendous state of fear, anxiety. What it was, what caused the great fear in her, I don't know. 
When I spoke with Tammy's mother, I told her that she should take Tammy to a doctor and also take her to the police to find out if the problem was psychological or if there was some basis in fact that someone was actually trying to kill her and get to the bottom of it, Leibowitz told the show Unsolved Mysteries, who aired a segment on Tammy's case in 1992. Yeah, that's what you heard in our little intro. Exactly. And Walter visited her on the set, and she kept saying that someone was going to kill her. Someone's going to kill her. Now, during her hysterical fit, she ranted to Walter about money laundering and how she had nowhere to hide. Which, I've got some theories on things that we'll get to later. It just Okay. So Tammy quit filming and went back home to be with her mother. She confided in her mother that one of her friends had bragged to her about a massive operation involving money laundering and drug trading with high-profile citizens of Brevard County being involved, allegedly consisting of police officers to bankers to prominent locals. Linda had no idea if her daughter actually had reason to be so afraid or if they were just paranoid delusions. Well, I mean, I would think that she would have to be scared if she saw something with high-profile people involved. Remember, she's a young, aspiring actress. Right. Well, so Linda convinced Tammy to speak to the local police, although there's no record of any report being made by Tammy. Her mother insists that Tammy did make a report. Which, in my eyes, would one would assume that maybe there were some high-profile police officers involved. Right. Or high-ranking officials. That made the report disappear. Exactly. So some sources say that Tammy did speak to police but refused to tell them that she felt her life was in danger. What she told police, if she ever even spoke to them at all, is a mystery. On July 1st of 1983, Tammy suffered another more serious breakdown. After briefly going outside of her home, she found that the door was locked. She then grabbed a baseball bat and smashed the front window. Oh. She yelled and hit Wing, believing that he had locked her out. But Linda was able to eventually calm her down. She think what 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 did she, why would she hit Wing thinking he did that? I don't know. Maybe he thought he was playing a joke or maybe, a prank. Maybe. I have no idea. I mean, because she did confide in Wing. She you know, they were, I guess, like buds. Yeah. So hmm. So Linda checked her daughter into the Brevard County Mental Health Center the next day. The doctor put Tammy on a 72-hour hold for for a psychological evaluation. She was kept under the doctor's care for three days before she was released with no evidence of drug or alcohol abuse or any indication of any other physical ailments. But what about mental ailments? Yeah, you remember this is 83, so it's kind of tough. I don't think that mental health was really, I think it was still more of a, I don't want to say like more of a mystery, but doctors didn't know then what they know now about the human brain. And especially what I'm getting out of this is there's some kind of trauma response to something that happened, something that she saw. Well, in the early days, they called it shell shock. Now it's called PTSD. PTSD, Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this, from what... I know, which I'm not claiming to be any sort of expert, but what's being described here looks to me like some sort of PTSD issue. Yeah. From, remember, and this from stems... something that happened. This stems back to the party, mm-hmm. which maybe we can discuss openly towards the end of the case after we finish, but um Yeah. But- but the, they did say that they felt that Tammy would not be a danger to herself or anyone else. So she was released from the hospital on July 4th. Okay. Okay. So finally she's released. Now, following her release, Tammy again mentioned to her mother that she was still in danger and made her mom promise to get revenge should anything happen. So she told her mom that if anything happens to me, I want you to avenge, you know, the actions upon me, if you will. On the day after Tammy left the hospital, with this being July 5th, Tammy went out for the evening with her friend Rick Adams and told him that she might be going away for a while, but didn't go into any detail as to what she meant by that. So Adams later recalled that he had thought Tammy may have been referring to her planned trip to California to film a movie. So apparently they've had a discussion. She's talking about going to California, and here's a situation coming back up, saying, hey, I'm going to have to go away for a while. And this is obviously just prior to her disappearance. And right after the release of her being in the hospital for right. 72 hours. 
So the next day, she makes plans to go to the beach with a friend, Keith Roberts. Apparently, Tammy had called Keith, who lived two hours away in Lakeland, Florida, and told him she needed his help. Now, Roberts was 22 years old, worked at a, as a banker, and had met Tammy years earlier in an acting class. He showed up to her house around 11 a.m. and honked the horn. Bye, Mommy. I'll see you in a little bit, okay? The last words Linda heard from her daughter, Tammy. Tammy left the house, according to her mother, Linda, without even brushing her hair, which was extremely uncharacteristic of her. Linda said Tammy usually spent a lot of time on her appearance before she ever left the house. Would make sense for an actress or model. Right. Roberts recalled that at one point during the drive, Tammy told him how unhappy she was living at home, that her mother had her committed to a mental hospital, and that she was so scared she slept with a knife under her pillow. But she did not say what she was so scared of. Well, according to Keith Roberts, she asked him to borrow some money and also drive her to Fort Lauderdale. So Roberts did agree to let her borrow $300, but he refused to drive her to Fort Lauderdale. Which is understandable. I mean, it's 170 miles from Rockledge, and he had just driven 100 miles from Lakeland to see her. So Tammy, obviously, you know, not getting what she wanted, I suppose, maybe became upset and demanded to be let out of the car. So he dropped her off five miles from her home, and he dropped her off on North Orlando Avenue at 1 p.m. in the parking lot of the Glass Bank. And this is on State Highway A1A. At some point after Roberts dropped Tammy off, she made some phone calls, presumably from the Exxon station nearby where she was let out. At a payphone, obviously, because remember, obviously. This, is, this is prior to cell phones. She made three calls to her aunt Ginger Kolosh's costume shop and another to her friend Rob Abley's video shop. The calls were missed, but Tammy left messages stating that she was calling from somewhere nearby and she sounded scared. So they obviously noticed that there was some stress in her voice when right. the messages were left. Right. So that usually doesn't bode well for her disappearance, of course, because mm-hmm. that makes it seem like it was not under her own free wish or her own free will. Right. So when Tammy failed to return home on that particular day, her mother called police to try to file a missing persons report. And as usual, because Tammy was 18, police were hesitant to take the report, which we find this all the time. All the time. In this genre. And I'm hoping at some point we can get beyond that. Yes. And say, okay, well, let's go ahead and file a report. Let's let's get it out there. And oh, if she comes back, call us back. But at least take the report or file something. Mm-hmm. Well, the police suggested that maybe she had ran away or otherwise left on, left on her own accord. But the police finally filed a missing persons report. And this was on July 11th, 1983. Five days after her disappearance. So five days after her mom is trying to file the missing person report, they finally take the report. So what happened to Tammy Lynn Liebert? Well, that's a good question, Lauren. Well, first, they considered her to be a runaway, which is probably why they, they postponed the report. Because right. usually that's the case. You know, obviously when you're 18 years old, though, you are allowed to just go if you choose. Right. Now, she had also been talking about going to Hollywood before she disappeared, which makes sense because she was an actress. Mm -hmm. Hollywood, like we said in the beginning, was the creme de la creme of you either make it or you don't. But Hollywood was the the place to be. Now, she also told her friend Rick Adams that she would be going away for a while. Now, those facts coupled with her supposed anger towards her mother, which she expressed to Keith Roberts about being thrown into a mental hospital and her asking him to drive her to Fort Lauderdale, could lead one to believe that Tammy just took off. So it's understandable. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she never turned up in Hollywood and has never been heard from or seen in over 36 years probably rules out the runaway theory. Probably. I mean, now you would think. Yeah. So obviously police looked at Keith Roberts first since he was the last person to see her. Now, although Keith was never named a suspect in Tammy's disappearance, Tammy's mother, Linda, claimed that Tammy was afraid of Keith. But if she was afraid of him, why would she have called him to come pick her up and then ask him to drive her to Fort Lauderdale? No, just a quick question. Here's one thing I couldn't figure out. Did she actually call him or did he just show up? And they assumed because he said, hey, she called me. Well, 
from all the research I did, she, she, it says that she called him. Okay. Because that was one thing. I mean, how do we know that? Is it, is it said by him? Because obviously if he just showed up, honked the horn, she goes out there, gets in the car. I, it's just one question I had. I, I, it, obviously it's not answered, but it's just a question. So after her disappearance, Keith was asked to take a polygraph exam, but he refused. He also declined to be interviewed by police twice. I understand the polygraph. I don't understand not talking to police. As far as the official investigation went, investigators failed to formally question Roberts for years. By 1990, he had only spoken briefly to detectives over the phone. His car was never searched. He was never formally interviewed and refused to polygraph. But authorities seemed to believe he had nothing to do with Tammy's disappearance, so they never pushed it any further. And that confuses me. Well, I mean, that's definitely, that's, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah. I I would have done things differently if I was on that case, probably. I'm sure a lot of people that's looked into this case has probably thought that same thing. Yeah. But of course. I mean, I understand that's... refusing a polygraph. And I think we've discussed this on this show before. I will never take a polygraph. Exactly. Because it's not going to help you in any way, shape, or form. And it, it can only hurt you. Yeah. And that's why I said I understand not taking the polygraph, but I don't understand not talking to the police. Because obviously. Yeah, that, that's fishy. That gets a finger pointed at you right away. Yeah. So before we get any deeper on that subject, let's talk about a few other things. So here's where the story gets a little bit darker. So Christopher Wilder, a.k.a. the Beauty Queen Killer, was an Australian suspected serial killer operating in the area at the time Tammy disappeared. Wilder was linked to at least a dozen disappearances, rapes, murders, and or attacks of women in the early to mid-80s. He was known to lure females into his home under the guise that they were auditioning for modeling gigs. If you think about that, that would have been a perfect ruse to trap Tammy, as she was, in fact, a model. Interestingly, one of his victims, Teresa Ferguson, was abducted seven miles from the glass bank on the A1A, where Tammy was dropped off by Keith Roberts. Wilder's history of violence toward women went as far back as his adolescent years, he faced numerous sexual misconduct charges during his early life, including a gang rape in 1962. He pleaded guilty at the age of 17 years old, receiving a one-year sentence of probation with counseling and electroshock therapy. Electroshock therapy? Yes, yeah, so it was in the 60s. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Wilder was really. also suspected in a 1965 murder of two teenage girls in Sydney, Australia, Marianne Schmidt and Christine Chirac were best friends and neighbors who were found brutally murdered and partially buried in the sand at Wanda Beach on January 11, 1965. Now that case remains unsolved. Married in 1968 at the age of 23, Wilder left his wife and became an American citizen in 1969, settling in South Florida. Figures but traveling back and forth to Australia to visit his family. The first documented sexual assault in the U.S. happened in 1976. A family had hired him to work on their home in Boca Raton. Their 16-year-old daughter was lured by Wilder to his truck and sexually assaulted. Wilder was eventually acquitted of the sexual assault charges. The second incident occurred in 1979 in Palm Beach, when Wilder was charged with a, the attempted rape of a 17-year-old. He had introduced himself to her as David Pierce, an agent for the Barbizon Modeling School, offering to photograph her for a pizza ad. Wilder would plead to lesser charges of attempted sexual battery and receive five years probation. What? Right. Five years probation. Right. So, so far... This guy's just getting slapped on hand, he's getting his hand slapped. Right. Yeah. And so But again, think about the time. I, I understand. There's that. very there's much stricter laws now than there were in the sixties and seventies. True. Well, let let's do a quick little breakdown. Now Wilder is suspected in the nineteen eighty four disappearance 
and I guess in deaths of Rosario Gonzalez in Miami. Now, she was a model and a Miss Florida contestant. There was Elizabeth Kenyon. This is in Coral Gables. And this is another Miss Florida pageant participant. There was Colleen Osborne. This is Daytona Beach. Teresa Terry Waite Ferguson. That's Harbor Beach. Now, she was an aspiring model and stepdaughter of a local police chief. Now, Terry Walden. This is Beaumont, Texas. She was a nursing student. Now, two days prior, Terry had told her husband that a man had approached her at a mall asking her to pose as a model, and she strongly declined this offer. But apparently, somehow, obviously, she ran back into Wilder. And there's Susan. Suspectedly. He's on, he's suspected in these. He hasn't been. I, I get it. Okay. I get it, but I'm still saying that it's okay. this, this kind of all, you see where the tie is, where this yes. whole modeling thing comes in. Yes. Which would make sense for Tam, Tammy. Tammy Lynn, yes. Because she would be more apt to do that. But I'm not sure so much. Only because once she become an actor, I'm not sure that the pageant thing is all that exciting anymore. Plus she was 18, 19? Yeah. Now there's also. 18. There's also Suzanne Logan, again, Beaumont, Texas, and this is another aspiring model. So that puts the Beaumont, Texas thing sort of into work. So obviously maybe a little bit of travels. There's Cheryl Bonaventure, and this is Grand Junction, Colorado, again in the travels. Now her car was found at the mall, locked, and her sunglasses were inside. Now this is Michelle Korfman. This is another aspiring model, but this is in Las Vegas, which would make sense if you're traveling from Florida to Texas. So you're kind of making the rounds, and you're, you're just kind of driving across country, which the man's from Australia, which makes sense. There's Tina Marie Risico. She's a high school student in Torrance, California. Donette Wilt. That's Maryville, Indiana. And there's also Elizabeth Dodge in Barrington, New York. Now, these are all... Basically, people that were, um, they disappeared or are, were found dead. Right. And this is in 1984. This is all, all in 1984. Suspected that Wilder was involved somehow. Right. So while on a visit home to Australia that same year, he was charged with kidnapping and sexually assaulting two teenage girls. Following this, his parents bailed him out of jail and he wound up flying back to the United States promising to return for his April 1984 trial. And I'm so glad the rules have changed in this because we're talking about a kidnapping and sexual assault of... Two teenage girls. Minors. Right. And you, you're you going to give them bond? And let them leave the country? But I guess that's Australia, so I, I don't know how the rules play there. But yeah, I'd, uh, and let him leave and say, oh, don't worry, I'll be back. No, hell no. Well, Wilder was killed in a 1980, in 1984 during a shootout with the police when he was headed to Canada. The police were never able to confirm his involvement in Tammy's disappearance. Now, just as a side note, believing that Wilder was responsible for Tammy's disappearance and presumed death, Tammy's family filed a million dollar lawsuit against Wilder's estate after his death. Linda, thought that she had recognized Wilder as someone who had visited her modeling agency several times in 1983 with the hopes of photographing her daughter. The judge ultimately threw the lawsuit out, citing not enough evidence to back it up. Linda Curtis later stated that she never believed Wilder to be responsible for her daughter's disappearance. So why why would she file the lawsuit? Would that be to maybe obtain some information? I mean, it, would you file a lawsuit? Well, to he was already people? dead. I know, but I mean, you file, if you file a lawsuit, if a judge says, okay, let's roll with it. Let's, let's, let's get some information out here. What's it called? Discovery, right? Yeah. So get in discovery. That allows her to maybe search for some information, some files. Uh, maybe that allows them to search his home or maybe find trophies or something that maybe would link him to Tammy. I mean, maybe you, you think that's why? I mean, why would you file a lawsuit against the estate? I don't know. It would seem to me that her she didn't need money. It would My seem to first me that it would be thought would just be like a, a grieving mother trying to get some retribution. Maybe she was doing as she was asked, avenging her her daughter's death. Maybe, maybe so, maybe so. Okay, so 
Let's talk about another theory other than that guy. So John Crutchley, a.k.a. the Vampire Rapist, was a suspected serial killer who lived 30 miles south from Rockledge, Florida. In 1985, he was arrested for abducting a hitchhiker and holding her captive in his house where he sexually assaulted her and drank a large quantity of her blood. She luckily escaped and survived. She was able to lead detectives back to his house. He later received a life sentence in prison in 1986 for these crimes. In 1988, Tammy was added to the list of his potential victims. However, by 1995, he was no longer being pursued actively as a suspect in her case by the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. In 2002, he committed suicide while in prison, and authorities never found a link to him regarding Tammy's disappearance. Well, I can understand that because if she thinks someone's trying to kill her, she's only dealing with friends. She's dealing with family. She's having people try her food. Um, certain things scare her. I can't picture her out there hitchhiking. Yeah, no. Yeah, I couldn't I picture her with that. her thumb up saying, hey, give me a ride and hop into the car with somebody. If, in fact, she felt like someone was trying to kill her. Right. So Tammy's sister, Suzanne, continues to search for her. She believes her disappearance could be connected to the death of Nancy K. Brown, a 25-year-old tourist from Illinois who was abducted from Cocoa Beach on June 4, 1983. Brown's remains were later found in a wooded area in Canaveral Groves in March of 1984. Both Nancy and Tammy shared several similarities. Both women were young and petite, both had light-colored hair and eyes. Both were last seen on the same street and vanished almost precisely one month from each other. And Nancy's murder is still unsolved. Well, over all the years, Linda has maintained that her daughter saw or knew something she wasn't supposed to have known. And whoever she was so afraid of is responsible for the disappearance, which is possible. I mean, whoever she's afraid of could have been the person that took her. That makes sense that... Someone was following her, or maybe it was Keith Roberts. He would never talk to police. You know, he's the last person to see her alive, which is usually always the main suspect. Right. So, however, these theories were also, these, none, of, none of this stuff has been confirmed. So there's nothing really, no solid evidence. Right. Now, the question remains is what occurred at this particular spring break movie party that Tammy attended that caused her to say she saw something terrible and that someone was trying to kill her? Because it seems like everything was fine with her. She was, like you said, she was bubbly. Everything was great. She goes to this party and comes back. So did she have like a, a bad trip at this party? Because well, I got to believe in 83, there was a lot, there had to be some drugs. Maybe she hadn't experienced drugs yet. And maybe, maybe drugs or something she tried at this party. Um, that was my thought was some sort of bad trip on, I guess maybe in the 80s it would have been acid or... Or could have been LSD. It could have LSD. been LSD. Um, I don't. I don't even know. Shoot. I mean, there was there was so much stuff. But usually, but see, you have that. But then there's cocaine. But cocaine is really not going to push you to that point. No, that cocaine's be, not going to make you hallucinate. Or I don't know. Honestly, I can honestly say, thank God, I have no clue. <laughs> well, I, I just don't. I, I think that if it if it had to do with something with drugs, my thought was maybe she would. Maybe purposely or somebody slipped something in her drink and she had some sort of bad trip where she... Which would make sense because maybe she felt like, okay, they poisoned me. This is why I felt this way. Yeah. Now I'm scared to taste my food or eat my food. Hey, taste this. And if, you know, poor wing, this yeah, guy's out there, wing. you know, taking one for the team. So it's either that or I, I don't know. I mean, she thought someone was trying to kill her. So I wouldn't think that it would be a drug related thing. So I would think more that it could have been something. Maybe she's seen something that was there or saw. I get that confused. We There's a little bit of discussion on Patreon about that. She saw something. Saw something there. Okay. Well, Tammy was rumored to have been three months pregnant at the time of her disappearance. Now, this, was this, however, was never confirmed. But is it possible that maybe when she was at this party, maybe it was a big party and maybe she got a little drunk, drunker than normal? Because she's still underage at this point. Is it possible she was raped and the pregnancy occurred? Well, the party happened in 
July or August of 1982, and she disappeared in July of 1983. So, so okay, that wouldn't have been the case. No, I don't know she why she could I didn't not have gotten pregnant at that party. Okay, but they 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 suspect that she may have been pregnant, which of course could have changed. That could have been complete rumor. Like I put, like when I was researching this, I made sure to put in our notes that that has not been confirmed because I, but I did see it on several of the sources, but it's not confirmed. So I wouldn't, I well, wouldn't put too much okay. into that. Okay. I'm just saying, cause it, it, as far as acting weird, you know, what could have happened after there? So she did mention some things about money laundering. Now, if she's, I, I can't imagine she went to a party and witnessed money laundering. At that to party, me would make yeah, no sense. No. I'm going to think more along the lines of maybe her, maybe she saw like, and I hate to bring this up, but we're starting to see a whole bunch of this now about these pedophilia rings. Maybe we're talking about actors. Maybe some actors seen some of this occur. Maybe she saw younger people. Maybe it happened to her because she was still young. She was very young, very beautiful, very fit. I mean, she was a model. So it's possible that maybe she was raped and maybe she witnessed some other young actresses at the time that maybe were not of age. Cause see, remember she would have been of age. Right. That this occurred and that could have been harsh if somebody were to find out. So maybe they, she seen this. They knew it. They were afraid she was going to say something and told her, Hey, if you say anything about this happening, we'll kill you. So therefore she's scared. Well, I, I don't know. And then of course, obviously you got many that speculated that she might have been abducted and sold into that sex trafficking. She might have been, you know, abducted and sold into sex trafficking. Exactly. So if she was sold into sex trafficking, and I, I know a lot of people look at that and I'm not trying to down that anyway, but it seems like that's like always one of the possibilities. And when, when, when someone comes up missing, there's always a possibility that that's the case. And we're starting to see more and more of that come out now. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I'm kind of, con- I, I don't know. I'm just trying to throw some stuff out there to see what, what sticks. But I think maybe she witnessed something in the aspect of what I was mentioning earlier that could have been detrimental because money laundering. I think she witnessed something. Either she went on a really bad trip and had some sort of hallucin- hallucination mm-hmm. and you know, they say sometimes if you go on a really bad trip, it never goes away. You're like completely kind of fucked in the mind forever. Or she did see something. What would be terrible? Like what you'd have to know, Tammy, like we can witness something and be okay, but maybe she witnessed something. I, I, I don't know how you to, know, and I, I, don't, I, I did a ton of research as far as trying to find. Like a crime that occurred, you know, what murders occurred around that, that particular time of any high profile people. Cause I got to imagine at this party, there was high profile people and I didn't see any. So I'm thinking if she witnessed like a murder, like, you know, a crime that occurred that would have been detrimental to somebody's career. Mm-hmm. That's why I, I leaned more towards the pedophilia because that could have occurred and a lot of people would have kept it quiet. A murder, people are going to know about that. Because somebody's missing. So I, I I don't know. Right. But anyway, all that aside, you know, while some believe that she might have been overwhelmed by responsibilities at that age, they maybe think that she just decided to run away and change her identity. Or is it possible that maybe she knew something? She saw something? She said something? And then maybe witness protection, witness protection program, because hey. we're talking about high profile people in Brevard County. We're talking about high profile profile people in the police department. We're also talking about high profile people in the movie industry because mm-hmm. they were at this party. So it's possible that maybe she got, she got picked up. She said, no, just drop me off. She got dropped off because that was the whole plan. She got picked up and then poof. And she became somebody new. Obviously, all speculation. I can't imagine, you know, talking about witness protection program. I can't imagine going into that at 18 years old and absolutely never contacting my family again. I'd probably be one of those that that screws it all up and calls my mama. Yeah. Well, (laughs) 
<laughs> I could picture that. Your mom would find your phone number and call you. Hi. <laughs> So Harold Lewis, the Cocoa Beach detective on the case, stated that not long after her disappearance, he received two phone calls from a woman who claimed that Tammy was alive and well. They don't know who this woman was. They just... No. Okay. When the woman called the first time, she said that Tammy was well and would contact them at the right time. The woman called again and said Tammy was doing what she loved, attending nursing school. Hmm? (laughs) That's totally random. Yeah. Uh, neither of these phone calls were substantiated. Unfortunately, Tammy's mother, Linda Curtis, died at the age of 54 on October 4th, 1995 in Orange, Florida. Tammy's sister, Suzanne, operates a Facebook page and message board to share information about the incident and also welcomes any leads anyone might have about the event. Suzanne believes her mother's theory about Tammy's disappearance and is still in search for her sister. So we've reached out to Suzanne to talk to us for this episode, but as of this recording, we have not heard back. I've seen on the Facebook page that I think maybe Suzanne is having some health thing, health issues going on right now. So we just hope and pray that she's okay. And if she would, if she'd like to reach out to us, we'd love to hear from her to discuss this case further. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and again, this is one of those, if you see something, say something. Mm-hmm. So you you would definitely contact uh what county was it we're, we're talking about Rockledge Brevard County Brevard County Yeah um I just I there's so many theories and I guess that's one of the things about the true crime genre is people can throw theories out there as far as okay I guess the couple questions that I have and that's why I tried to play that earlier what did she see at this party um did she just go off you know she she got dropped off and that strange thing happened that, uh, as I call it, the Moore Murray effect, where right. something just all of a sudden everything randomly lined up perfectly and that's it, gone. I just find it odd that uh, that's why I said, I mean, could it be the witness protection program? They, they picked her up and said, okay, come with us, blah, blah, blah. But then again, you know, you, you say that you would mess it up and call your mom, but it's possible that maybe they said, look, and she was so scared that she felt like this is the only thing to save her life. I just don't see her getting picked up by somebody. Somebody pulling up and saying, hey, you want to get in the car? I'll give you a ride. Because she was so skeptical of everybody. She was skeptical of someone poisoning her. She thought someone was trying to kill her. So I would assume that if a random stranger showed up and said, hey, get in the car. I'll give you a ride. She would have said, oh, no. Right. So, and I guess that's where, that's where I kind of get lost in this case. I just find that it, it's, it's awful because, I mean, here we're talking about a, 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 it's a beauty queen. She's an actress, a woman who was full, obviously, of life and uh, had everything going for her. Mm-hmm. I mean, she had everything that a woman dreams of and, you know, she was an aspiring actress. So all it would take was that one thing to really just boost her entire career and she, had her friend pick her up and just disappeared. Yeah. And it's a very sad scenario. And that's where these scenarios are so tough because you try to, everybody wants to try to find an answer. You know, yeah. like me, you know, you try to do the research and you're like, what could it be? And you want to solve a case. Obviously it's, it's, it, there's probably been so much, so much involved in this case. There's there, nothing we're going to do here at Paradise After Dark is going to solve this case. But if somebody out there hears about this who maybe knows something, it's been several years. I mean, it's been like 36 years, 37 yes. years. It's time. Yeah. It's time. Let, let's pick up the phone. Let's call Brevard County. Let's call Crime Stoppers. Call somebody. Right. If you were involved in this and you know who was involved, I don't care. Call your lawyer and say, hey, look, I'm ready to talk to police. This is it. Let's mm-hmm. get this solved. This is an unsolved case, and that's one thing we never like in the true crime genre is, is unsolved cases. Exactly. So, Tammy Lynn Leppert, we are ready to hear an end to this case. That's right. And so, I don't um, – do you have anything else for tonight? I mean, that just – No, that's I, pretty I wish, much the case. There's that's, a, that's all we know about Tammy Lynn Leppert. Yeah, and there's so many other theories out there, so – you know, you can really look into this case, obviously, but um, the most prominent theories are the ones that we discussed here. So. Right. 
Okay, so uh, Lauren, I guess that's it for tonight. This is the case of Timmy and Leopard. And again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Paradise After Dark Podcasts. And you can also check out our Etsy store for some awesome Paradise After Dark swag. Make sure to follow us on social media at Paradise After Dark Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and at Paradise Dark 239 on Twitter. And don't forget about our Patreon shirt giveaway. Once yes. a month. It's We're random. Away shirts now. It's random. And to verify, we video it and post it. That's right. So, and you can, if you want to hit Lauren up with some stuff, you have a question, you want a case suggestion, something, email us at Paradise After Dark Podcast at gmail.com. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review. This really helps us branch out to reach a wider audience. Yes, yes, yes. Five stars. Five Don't stars. To review us. Preferably five stars. Preferably. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'd also like to thank everyone for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.